Uh, welcome to our December quarter update. Hope everyone had a, a great new year and um, a Merry Christmas. Obviously last year was uh, quite a strong year. Uh, markets uh, up you know, nearly 40% and for the first time in a long time the currency was helpful and it would decline about 15%. Uh, we're basically now in a situation where equity is probably best described as you know, not expensive but also not cheap. And so there's a bit of a dilemma in terms of how we're going about uh, investing new capital. Uh, I think probably the best way to, to illustrate it is to, to refer to a couple of the stock charts um, of stocks that we own in our portfolio. First one is probably Howard Hughes, uh, property investment, you know, Las Vegas theme that everyone knows well. But if you take a look at the chart, you'll see that uh, over the past year, it has performed uh, quite strongly, uh, up 40, 50, 60%. Um, and uh, as a result, uh, even though we're still happy to own it, uh, we probably wouldn't put new capital into it at this very point. Uh, we'd rather wait for a bit of a correction. If we then go to the next uh, chart, Wells Fargo, one of our banking stories, and pretty much illustrates what's been going on over the last five years. Uh, the beginning of the period, uh, you had a sharp uplift uh, from the very depressed levels post GFC. And then the stock uh, sort of treaded water for uh, you know, two or three years as the market um, you know, was concerned or wasn't 100% confident that the US economy was in fact in recovery mode and therefore were not willing to uh, expand the multiple uh, on the stock. And then as the market uh, over the last you know, 12, 18 months has become convinced that in fact the US economy is recovering, uh, you'll start to see earnings growth, uh, the stock's taken another leg up and uh, again has been a very, very strong performer recently. So at the moment it sells on a you know, reasonable multiple, but uh, it's obviously changed a bit over the last 12 to 18 months. So again, in terms of putting new capital to work, uh, our view is that we probably just want to be a little bit patient and, and wait for something to happen in the markets. If we then go to our next example, which is Google, again, exactly the same story as Wells Fargo, the sharp uplift after the post GFC, then it goes sideways for a couple of years as the market's toing and froing in terms of um, you know, the, the economic recovery and what's going on in Europe. And then the last 12 to 18 months, very strong performance as earnings comes through. It's, it's very clear, again, that the economy's um, are moving ahead. So bottom line, uh, we sit here today uh, I think we mentioned that in our, you know, our newly listed uh, vehicle, we're still sitting with about 100% cash uh, because as those charts illustrate, uh, there has been significant changes in uh, valuation stock prices. So I think we've just got to be patient short term um, and wait for the stocks maybe to come back to a level that we're again happy to deploy uh, new capital. So in terms of where we head uh, over the longer term or medium term, um, Tough to know at the, at, at the moment. Uh, the reality is we're in uncharted waters in terms of uh, the significant impact that the Fed has had with their, their bond purchases. We're just at the beginning of the tapering. Um, and again, people will speculate on what they think uh, might happen, what the impact might be. But the reality is we don't know. Uh, we're just gonna have to look at it in hindsight. But one thing that is very, very clear is that we're coming to the end of a 30 year bull market in interest rates. And again, I think we're referring to a slide which highlights uh, the double digit yields that you used to get 30 years ago. Uh, they troughed uh, recently about 2.5%. Um, and with the Fed starting to taper, my suspicion is that that's the end of that bull market. And we're now going to have a situation where interest rates are going to be rising for the next you know, 5 to 10 plus years. Initially, probably slowly. Uh, they'll then sort of gather steam. And as is typical, uh, some point down the track, they'll get very, very aggressive. And that's probably the time that you obviously want to sell uh, equities. But as I mentioned, in, in the meantime, it's a bit hard to know exactly what the impact will be. Uh, one thing that is also clear though, along with the fact that interest rates have probably come to their end, is that that 30 year downtrend in interest rates has probably driven an over-concentration of uh, particularly retail investors uh, investment portfolios into the so-called uh, classic defensive yield type stocks, whether it was property trusts, whether it was banks, uh, anything with a high predictable yield and a high payout ratio. Um, and as I say, the, the fact that you've had 30 years of interest rates falling at your back has reinforced those trends. And I suspect that most people have become very overweight in terms of their personal portfolios.
We've got a chart that we're referring to that highlights that 60% of uh, domestic retail investors' equity earnings are in banks. And that's interesting because over the last quarter in our Australian fund, we sold all of our bank holdings uh, out of the portfolio because we believe that valuations have started to reach uh, their upper limit and therefore we should be uh, putting the capital aside and waiting for, for better opportunities. So I guess the point we're trying to make is that when you have long, uh, uh, big long trends in the markets and as they come to an end, you typically get people owning too much of that trend, being over concentrated in that. And with the turn in interest rates, uh, I think people have to have a really hard think about uh, how their portfolios are allocated and they probably need to change uh, their weightings. Um, you know, one of the reasons that we brought out the lick was to highlight uh, uh, to investors that probably the risk reward proposition is, is uh, now starting to tilt towards uh, offshore uh, assets as it's supposed to onshore. Now the reality is, as I mentioned, the, the currency has declined 15%. Uh, short term it might stabilise, might uh, you know, bounce a little bit. We still think the longer term trend is down, uh, probably should be trading around the low 80 cents at this particular point of time, and the rest will determine on how, uh, how big an impact China has on the commodity markets going forward. Uh, so as a result, we're, even though, we've, you know, as I said, the, the currency has declined, we're continuing to remain unhedged in our, uh, our offshore portfolios. Um, apart from that, you know, as I said, there's nothing that really stands out at the moment. You know, we're kind of doing a lot of work on a number of different areas uh, in terms of uh, finding new opportunities uh, for capital. Uh, but at the moment, uh, as, uh, you know, we're basically you know, reduced uh, to probably 65% invested um, and sticking with some of the, the themes that have been consistent over the last two or three years, but looking very, very hard for, for new opportunities. Uh, in terms of Fed tapering, and the turn in bond yields, I suspect that will also have a significant impact on Asia uh, over the next five to 10 years. Uh, again, they've had uh, one trend at their back uh, and that's about to change. And uh, I guess in relation to Asia, yeah, Kevin Batoli, our fund manager, is gonna talk a little bit about uh, what he sees there. Recently went on a trip with Ashley Pettout, our global portfolio manager uh, to the US uh, doing some background research on a number of uh, Asian stocks that um, uh, have investments on either in America or influenced by what's going on over in uh, the United States. I'll let him talk about that. But I would like to put a plug in for his fund because over the last five years, uh, no matter what time period you look at, he's probably been ranked number one or number two uh, in his peer group of about 40 managers. Uh, and generated significant returns in excess of you know, the benchmark returns and in my opinion you know, certainly deserves to be on the approved list for Asian funds. So it's something that uh, if you're not using the fund uh, and do invest in Asia, you know, please uh, have a look at because I think he's well and truly earned the right to, um, uh, to be considered as one of your Asian fund managers. Thanks for that Paul. During the quarter we undertook a, our annual research trip to the US we visited 30 companies and eight to 10 major cities over the space of three weeks. It was clear to us from the trip and, and previous trips we've taken to the US that the, the environment continues to recover nicely. Majority of the companies that we met continue to see improved uh, operating metrics and operating environment for their businesses. Uh, but it was refreshing to see that, that none of these companies were taking the recovery for granted and were fairly conservative in their estimates. Uh, Although we understand that you know, recovery in the US isn't going to be in a straight line, we think the current environment and, and the outlook bodes well for our holdings. Essentially you've got you know, structurally low wages and rising energy production which are basically boosting a resurgence in US manufacturing. Uh, you have a an improvement in the labour markets driven by an improvement of the property markets and construction. And finally you, you also have you know, fairly low consumer prices which continue to be a benefit for the, for the end demand. Uh, while on the trip we also did an extensive tour of US gaming assets uh, on the east coast and also finished in Las Vegas where we met with the, the, the operators there to discuss their outlook for Macau which is a major component for our, for our Asian fund. Uh, Las Vegas continues to recover quite nicely and should be driven by a strong convention cycle in, in the first half of this year. Um, Howard Hughes, a, a major part of our global fund and the largest residential owner, a landowner in, in Vegas, 
is essentially feeling strong enough with a recovery in Vegas to progress with their Summerlin Shops development, uh, which is the first kind of vertical development you know, that they've done within that master plan community. Longer term, we think this drives volume and price for their residential land. Uh, in terms of Macau, we came away with a strength, strength and conviction of our view there. Uh, essentially, Macau is going to be, uh, Macau and Asia is going to be the focus for the US gaming, uh, gaming operators going forward. We think the, the current dynamic in terms of the competitive environment remains very stable. You have uh, a decreased uh, aggressive stance from some operators in terms of uh, commissions. You have uh, no new capacity coming on until 2016 at the earliest. Uh, so we think these two factors bodes fairly well for the existing operators. Uh, the existing supply should therefore benefit from what we see as very strong uh, growth in visitor arrivals over the next couple of years. Uh, in terms of the risk to, to Macau, we actually think they're manageable at the moment. The two main ones being you know, a crackdown on the VIP business, which is actually becoming a smaller part of, of operations, uh, and license renewals and, and new licences. We think both of those factors are, are, are fairly maintainable or manageable. Uh, the third part of the trip was going down to Mexico for the annual uh, Heineken Forum. Heineken basically got together man the management teams from across the Americas to present uh, with particular focus on the Mexican business that they acquired in 2010. You know, we think there's substantial opportunity to, to grow that me Mexican business in particular from, and, and that's kind of twofold. One on, on market share gains, they have a very strong suite of products against, you know, against their competitor across different points in, in, in the pricing spectrum. And secondly, margins are about half that of their, their nearest competitor. Uh, so the outlook for Heineken, we came away from the trip you know, fairly, fairly happy with. You know, the business trades on an ungeared yield of about 9%. Uh, and you, what you're seeing is an increased uh, exposure to uh, developing markets with acquisitions in you know, Latin America and Asia over the last couple of years, which bodes fairly well for, for growth going forward. Uh, so from me, that's, that's it, and I'll hand back to Paul. So in conclusion, it has been a big year for financial markets and I'd reflect back on just how much sentiment has changed. I'm sure you see that amongst your clients. Uh, 12 to 18 months ago, we found it very, very hard to get people to invest in the equity market, but that has definitely changed. And that probably tells you that you want to be a little bit cautious short term, and that's in fact what we're doing. Uh, we're just basically being patient and waiting for stocks to now come back to levels that we want to either invest in the same stocks again or hopefully the work that we're doing at the moment, uh, when we come back uh, at the end of the March quarter, we'll actually have a few uh, new additions for the portfolio. I'd also uh, encourage you to send us any questions, if you have any feedback either on the webinar or the quarterly report, uh, but in particular any questions you might want us addressed, you want us to talk about any stocks, uh, anything of that nature, please uh, email uh, Rob Thompson or uh, Chris Donoghue. Uh, and we will endeavour to incorporate that in our uh, next quarterly report or uh, webinar. So with that, uh, I'll sign off and, um, and uh, let's see how the next quarter goes.